morning. Welcome to Diane's Kitchen. No, it's not a cooking show, but it's a place where we sit down at the kitchen table, have a cup of coffee, and talk to some interesting people. Today, you are just going to absolutely be floored <laughs> by what my guest, Jan Thompson, does. First of all, we would like to thank our sponsors. We have the Body Shop Fitness Centers, both of them, Shell Lake and Spooner. We've got Greenfield PT and Sports Medicine, and of course, the Edina Lakes team. Thank you so much for sponsoring us. I hardly know where to begin. I mean, this was, this was, this interview was providential because you had called yeah. our home mm -hmm. looking for my husband, who is the um, Town township chair. chair. Mm -hmm. And I got to talking. Jan's a really easy person to talk to. <laughs> and um, she said, I'm looking for information on a cemetery. Well, it would, sometimes we get people like that, you know, looking where so grandma. I'm not the only one out there. <laughs> yeah, but they were not the, for the same reason you were. People call looking right. for grandma, right. for grandpa, because, you know, people were buried years ago and unmarked or yes. there yeah. maybe a wooden cross that's long gone. Not Jan. When she explained what she did, I said, please, please, could you come sit down, have coffee, and tell your story about what you do. So first of all, where are you from? I am from Barron. From Barron. Yes, and actually I get a lot of my information from my sheriff by watching <laughs> <laughs> up in Washburn. So oh, cool. I, so I'm, I'm familiar with sure. the Dryden Wire, but I wasn't familiar with, with your show. So it was interesting to hear about that, and I've been able to go and look at your shows. Good. And, gotten a lot of good information good yeah well that's what we try even if it's oddball information we yeah. like to get it out there so what is your official title with the team that I'm with canine emergency response team canine emergency response, response team. team I am with the Northwestern Division we also have a central division people down in the south or south central okay um, Wisconsin um, I am a canine handler. All right. Were you a cop? No. How did you get to be a canine handler before we go too far? Um, I got into this over 20 years ago. Oh, my. Uh, many years ago, I had um, watched a news report on the earthquake that devastated Mexico City. I believe it was 1982. And at that time, I was a young mother with a lot of little children running around and um, I'm watching this show and there's a woman working her dog up into the rubble yeah. of the city and she's directing the dog here and there and the dog was looking for survivors and it just kind of stuck in my mind that that is just the coolest thing I've seen. Hmm. But being a mother with young children, I didn't have time to no. investigate it. So it wasn't until um, over 20 years ago, I was doing a PR event for the ambulance service from Barron um, at the casino, and there was a small Polk County canine group. Okay, ambulance doing, service. Were you in? I was an EMT. An EMT. That was my part-time job there, yes. And what was your full-time job? Health unit coordinator. Of course. <laughs> How many kids do you have? I have four. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. So um, they were doing a demonstration, and I excused myself from my group. I'll be back in a little bit. And I went and talked to them and asked them about their group and how you get started. Mm -hmm. And I joined them. And I spent a good year hiding for the dogs learning about the breeds, learning about the training, which was completely different than what I had grown up with. When I grew up, it was the yank and crank, basically telling your dog what you're doing wrong. You never tell your dog what you're doing right. This oh. was completely different. This is more, this is clicker training or behavior modification, and it uses positive reinforcement for when the dog is doing something right, right so that they want to do that whatever it is you're asking them, they want to do that for their reward. So after you learned that, did you look back and say, you know, I could have done clicker training with my kids. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> totally. 
Click. Wrong. Yes, absolutely. Or husbands. <laughs> oh, well, no, there's no hope. No. Clickers, big sticks, nothing works. <laughs> yes, I actually wish that I had become this type of dog handler, trainer, before I had children. I think I would have been probably a better mother. Yeah, absolutely. Well, where's the book? How come you are, you're not doing a book signing? Right. <laughs> Writing your, bringing up your children with clicks and rewards. Clicks, yes. I can see it now. I get 10%. Okay. Yeah, okay. So ambulance, yes. health work, yes. things that were good. Yep. But First yet responder. in the back mm-hmm. of your mind, you always remembered that yes. woman, oh, that dog, yes. giving directions, yes. watching watching them save people yeah. who and they as thought soon as were I gone. I saw that group, it was just like, yes. I'm home. <laughs> Yeah, and I didn't learn until mm-hmm. years later. Her name was Carolyn Hebert, and she wrote a book, and it's called So Others May Live. And that's kind of the byline, that model that uh, most canine handlers go by. Is so other, We do this so others may live. What a great idea. Yes. You know, we most of the counties around here now have dogs. A lot of police oh, yeah. departments have yes. dogs. Uh, some use them a lot. Some, you know, it's seldom that they're called out. Uh-huh. We don't have a lot of high crime. We don't have a lot of, we don't have a lot of uh, ah, things uh-huh. going on. But we do have a lot of missing people. We have a lot of walkaways yeah. at nursing homes, especially yeah. the, the people that don't have some sort of an electronic device, uh-huh. so a GPS, so they can be found. Uh-huh. Ours are less dramatic. They're not buildings falling down and tsunamis going through town. But when they need them, they are absolutely amazing yes. at what they can do. Yes. One of the reasons that you called my husband was to find information about a cemetery. What has a cemetery got to do with training a dog for disaster? Recently, our group has been... Uh called in to mutual aid with other groups um, to search for people who went missing years ago. What's years? Years, um, I think, let's just average around 20 years. The several of the the, um, searches we've been on lately, and that includes Minnesota, not just Wisconsin, but Minnesota. Okay. So we are looking for ways to further our training for our dogs to locate people who have died and have been buried years ago. It's like a completely different scent profile than what we're used to. You try and get as many scent profiles in your dogs, what we call the Rolodex in their brain. Sure. So that when they stop to smell something, you can almost see that Rolodex going around in their brain until it stops on, oh, yes. I've smelled this before. Yes, and this is what I have been trained to indicate on. So that's what we were we are looking for is old older graves, ones that are marked, ones that aren't, so that we can find the ones that are marked. We know somebody is there. We know usually there's a marker telling us when they were buried. Mm-hmm. Hopefully they weren't involved, changing that scent profile oh, sure. from what we want the dogs to find mm-hmm. and not in a sealed casket or a vault that would hold in the scent. Right. But aren't a lot of the people, somehow a picture comes to my mind, that what you're looking for is people that have been buried in the woods Yes. Killed and been buried in the woods. Or... clandestine graves. Yes. Oh, clandestine graves. Exactly. So yeah. there's no embalming. There's no There's right. no nothing. They've right. just been rolled into a spot. How do you train a dog to smell that profile? And that's where you try to find these graves, identify them as a person buried there in the conditions that you're looking for, and you start working your dog in what a across those graves and rewarding the dog when their nose goes down. And so they go, oh, I get rewarded for smelling this. Smelling this. We have a couple instructors, and they're nationally known instructors, nationally known within the canine handler groups, mm-hmm. um, coming up to help train us. 
and his request was we need these cemeteries so that because I am the closest person from this group that will be training here um, I'm only 45 minutes away they tasked me with finding the cemeteries we needed at least three and I started just <laughs> all over. You have an amazing person named, I believe it's Clay Talent at the Historical Society, mm -hmm. and he has been just a wealth of information. Oh, I, I don't know if I could have even found your name mm -hmm. or um, a lot of the other ones if it wasn't for him looking looking this information up for me. I, I did really not appreciate Clay Talent if you're watching. Good. <laughs> I really didn't understand the function of the um, the human society historical society yes. I am just amazed at the research that's mm -hmm. done there and you can go and you can research families mm -hmm. uh, it's just amazing what you can do there they have people from all over the United States yes coming calling emailing looking for information mm -hmm. When you look for a cemetery, what kind of cemetery do you look for? The ones that I was looking for, again, had to have mm -hmm. older graves that were marked, and hopefully bodies weren't embalmed. Um, like, I believe the Spooner Cemetery, they can't guarantee that those bodies aren't embalmed. At some point, we're going to assume that they weren't because it really wasn't popular until the 1950s. So most people before that, that were buried before that, were not embalmed. So we're going to hope that. Yes. Do you know when the vaults, the big metal vaults came Whenever into play? Whenever the cemeteries decided that um, the ground was too uneven <laughs> to maintain it. So whenever the maintenance crew decided that, you know, we really need the vaults to keep the, the ground nice and even so we can maintain it better. Well, true, because without a metal vault, a wooden box or just a body would eventually decompose and you would have big dips right. in the cemetery. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you get to pay thousands of dollars more on your funeral expenses thanks to the maintenance crew. Yes. <laughs> well, that's good to know. Yes. How old can a body be and still be? located how how many years dead well that i don't know i do know that one of my instructors that i work with his name is jim delbridge he is from tulsa oklahoma or mustang oklahoma i think he is considered a forensic coroner he goes out and he identifies old pioneer graveyards people who have traveled across the country in their covered wagons and maybe they set up the camp somewhere before they made it to California or whatever and he is called upon many times to bring his dogs out to identify those graveyards. Pioneers. Pioneers and old Native American burial grounds. So too. how many years are we talking? Well, 18, early 1800s, maybe. And dogs can still pick up a scent? Yes. Wow. Yes. Oh my goodness, that's he just has, amazing. He has shown me pictures of um, his dogs and, and his dog will sit down here, work, 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 sit down here and you can just see the line. You know, it's like a perfect line of, of graves. Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, when you read these going west stories, which mm -hmm. I think everybody either has or should, mm -hmm. it was so sad because so many people brought a big piece of furniture that obviously didn't make it. They left right. it on the side. Right. So mm -hmm. many people brought things that they realized halfway there. Mm -hmm. These are totally irrelevant, mm -hmm. and they left them, and they buried their dead yes, and moved did. on, which must have been hard. I mean, not only did they leave their family, I mean, leave their family. Mm -hmm. No internet, uh, very little mail delivery. You mm -hmm. may never see your family again. 
there's a lot of women's diaries, and I think a lot oh, of that yes. information comes from their diaries of yeah. pioneer women yeah. that were moving across the country. Right. Yeah. You know, and to have a child, you just bury and move on. Mm-hmm. They were tough. Yes, they, they had were. to be tough. Yes, they were. But I think women do tough. Women can do tough. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I think it's about 80% of the volunteer canine handlers are women. Why? I don't know. Do Do I you think know. dogs relate better to a woman, or do you think a woman absolutely. is more intuitive with the dog? <laughs> Both. Well, I do, Both. too. That's why we were but, picked to be mothers. Um. I really don't know if they've decided why, you know, why that is. In the uh, law enforcement, I believe it's complete reverse. I think it's um, 80% men who handle the dogs in law enforcement. But in the volunteer world, it's women. You know, I have never heard of a woman canine. I'm sure there are, but I have never met one or heard of one Mm -hmm. because you're right it's always the guys yes you know it's the training it's the jumping over and Mm -hmm. going to the Mm -hmm. training meets and things yeah how old how long have you been in involved with the canine grave dogs when i started working my first partner and i got her a year after i had been with my first team okay after I had decided on the breed I wanted. Of course, I picked a shepherd because I think back in my mind, I remember Carol Hebert in that news documentary working her shepherd. Right. So I got a shepherd and she was an amazing first partner. She taught me so much. And she's like the perfect first partner because no matter what I screwed up on, it didn't matter. She still came through like a champ. But there weren't that many live finds for us to work on. So we decided to cross train into human remains detection or cadaver dog mm-hmm. for recovery, which also includes drownings. So we were a lot busier when, um, when we certified in that. Drownings, how does yes. that relate a body falls out or is killed and they're carried downstream how would or in a lake Mm -hmm. and well as soon as you die you start doing what's called gassing off you start your bacteria starts microphaging on you on on your body and you create gases Mm -hmm. which are lighter than the water and lighter than the air oh sure you float then well the gases do oh before you do oh and by working the dogs across the water on a low boat, they are able to pick that up the and identify where where the subject is, which helps to for recovery. You know, they and especially if you're in a river where it's dangerous, um, for divers to go in to recover a body, if yeah. you can identify where that body is, it's much easier than diver divers going down and just feeling around or looking around, hoping that they, they come across. So a something. body in a in water, a mm-hmm. body in a body of water, will mm-hmm. f- come to the, t- for eventually. how long? Eventually. So eventually they There's s- a float chart sink. somewhere in my, in my papers, <laughs> and it tells you if the body of water is a certain temperature, how long it'll be before the body Science. should float. Mm-hmm. And then does the body float for a long time? No. How long would you say they surface? You it know, depends I, on it the depends, water and the... It depends on how much decomposition took place, too. So, you know, whether they go back down, they're up for a short time, okay. and then they go back down again. So yeah. how long of a window, just approximately, because each one would be different, does a dog have? And is the dog in the boat? Yes. Smelling over the side for the yes. gases? Yes. How long? For the decomposition. Mm -hmm. Okay. How long does that last? I mean, does the dog have, okay, you've got 20 minutes, go. Or is it you've got two weeks? Or we think he died there. As long as the body's in there, you're going to have decomp. As long as there's a body there. My goodness. I mean, that could, that would change the numbers considerably. Yes. Wow. Have you been to a 
I don't know what you'd call it, a discovery? And then they dig up the body or they find the bones or the body or what's left or? I have not discovered or identified a burial yet. We're still kind of in that process of learning. Okay. Mm-hmm. I have heard of and seen a, uh, I don't know what you would call it, a program about a place down south, I can't remember this state, that has, you must because you're smiling, that has bodies Mm -hmm. in various states. Stages of decomposition, and it's called the body farm. Oh, my goodness. And it's at the university in Knoxville, Tennessee. Tennessee. After my first partner and I, Cookie and I, had... um, had yeah, got cookie. Cookie. <laughs> There's cookie, tippy toes, <laughs> Brooke, Brooke, and my current dog, uh, canine partner is Yogi Beer. Oh, uh, have they all been shepherds? No. Oh, okay. No. Go back to the body okay, thing. The and body then I'll farm. Ask about the dogs. Uh, cookie and I had traveled to Texas, and I can't tell you what year. 2005, 2006, and we trained with a group down there called Task. And there were HRD handlers, cadaver dog handlers, and uh, instructors that gave me a really good understanding about how to work my dog. And they said, you work on this for a year, you come back, and then we'll certify you. Okay, so I did that. I went, came back home and continued to work my dog the way that they told me to. And a year later, I went back down there, and we certified in uh, human remains detection. Shortly after that, the group called me up and said, would you like to meet us down in Knoxville, Tennessee, and spend a day at the body farm? And I moved heaven and earth to be able to get down there. We all and have different ambitions in life, don't we? <laughs> I mean, if somebody invited me to the body farm, I would have to say, pass. It was Thank amazing. You. It was very surreal because there yes. was a home game going on in the football stadium. Every pair you looked, there was orange and white, people wearing orange and white, and here we are next to the stadium working our dogs in an acre with about 200 bodies. And if you ever want to read about the body farm, uh, Death's Acre. Death's Acre? Death's Acre. I'm going to have to read that. And that um, was written with Dr. Bill Bass, who was the one who started the body farm so that he could identify how long a body has been dead. The work is so valuable. It is. I mean, there are people in garbage cans. Yes. There are people in shallow graves, you know, some just starting. And depending on the bugs, depending on the decomposition. Right. It's something to study for what you need to know, but mm-hmm. it, you know, there's just something that mm-hmm. puts that in that issue like, category there are for multiple me. experiments going yes. on. And it's not just people studying death, there's also with students that were studying the bugs, you know, they were whatever oh, sure. that was sure, their sure, sure. you know, that was their major mm-hmm. and there was other science majors that were studying the gases. I think now they've identified over six hundred different decomposition gases when we die, oh and they're my. still counting. It's hard to put on a resume. Okay, so yes, your is. last job here, it says that, <laughs> how does your family, how do your children feel about, I mean, what do they say when, what does your mom do? <laughs> they well, certainly weren't as receptive sometimes as, as you were when you talked to me. they just like, oh, yeah, mom does that dog thing. You know that dog thing. That dog thing. Ah, yeah. we yeah. won't get too particular here. <laughs> they are. They are uh, proud of it. You know when they do bring it up and talk about. It. I yeah. They've invited me to talk to their kids' schools. You know I, oh, I do sure. a lot of, a lot of um, education in schools and and um, I do a program called Hug a Tree and that's through the NACE, That's through NASAR, the National Association of Search and Rescue, put together this program. Uh, called Hug a Tree, and that's teaching kids how to be safe out in the woods or if they get lost. And then basically, they are staying so close to like a tree. Pick the friendliest tree, and you stay so close, you're hugging it. 
Good idea instead of wandering mm -hmm. around. Yes, and the ki what to carry. Make sure you always carry like a whistle and a garbage bag. When you show them how to put a garbage bag over their head, you know, after they've made a hole so that they can breathe through it. Uh, so they stay dry and warm if they oh. have to spend the night. Oh, you sure. Know, any time out in the woods waiting. and Sure. Yeah. I would imagine that would be very valuable because adults get lost, mm -hmm. kids get lost. Yes. You know, and you hear some of these stories about these people, especially in the Midwest, who go off big cliffs and they're mm -hmm. down there, you know, they're mm -hmm. alive, but they've lived in their car for seven days and they've, you know, drunk water from the leaves yeah. and yeah. and they make it. Mm -hmm. <sighs> So you have to be more or less on call. Mm -hmm. Do you only do Wisconsin and Minnesota, or could you be called to any state at any time? I've been called as far away as Canada. There's a group in uh, Minnesota called Sermon, and they work with the John Francis Foundation. John Francis went missing out west, and they gave up on the search after so long. They couldn't find him. I think he was he was climbing in the mountains or hiking in the mountains. How do those stories and you hear? So the father, who lives over by the cities, found um, the search and rescue the sermons, search and rescue and recovery resources of Minnesota, Oy. and asked them, "Can you find my son?" So they put together a large group of people, experts, and they went out. West and yes, they did locate the remains of his son. Oh, he had died. after I believe a year. He had been out at least a year. So the father, in his son's memory, put together this foundation, and it's to help other families whose um, loved one went missing. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure the area of where that person mm -hmm. went missing, and helps the family fundraise to bring in all these. Experts, sure. searchers, um, and this is about the only time that we maybe ever get reimbursed for our travel and, and our accommodations is when we uh, work with them. And we were called up to Canada and to look for uh, a young girl that had gone missing, I believe, two years prior. And the Canadian police, I believe, identified the campground ah. as the most probable area. Okay. Another clandestine grave um, and asked us to come in and, and search. And did you find her? And that is Canadian oh. information. Oh, okay. Yeah. Quickly, because oh, we're running out of time. Are we? Yes, <laughs> I know. I know. We could sit here all morning and it would be like 15 minutes. Yeah. You said you started out with uh, a certain dog. Yes. You've had four dogs. Yes. And what have they been? Uh, Cookie, Cookie Dog, we called her um, a shepherd, and she did both. She did Live Find Area, and she did um, HRD, uh, Land and Water. Then my next dog, and that's probably another day for another story. She was a blue tick coon hound. Mm -hmm. And I thought I was going to make her my off-lead disaster dog, that I was going to be able to work her in a disaster area. And there's a special certification for that, oh. which my first dog didn't have at oh. that time. And she is the one who taught me that you don't let a coon hound off-lead and expect <laughs> them to listen to you. She became my tracking dog. Oh, uh, sure. Oh, oh she yeah. Was, she was amazing. I learned so much from her because there's a certain body language that you have to watch for all the time when they're tracking. And I think I learned more about dogs' body behavior, watching her being at the end of that, that lead for mm -hmm. however many years that I was tracking with her. Did you ever find a coon up a tree? <laughs> no, she learned. She learned to find people. Good. And to leave the leave the people or leave the animals alone. And then when I was retiring Cookie Dog from doing the large 
land searches mm -hmm. for people. She got too old for that. She was still doing cadaver. Um, what is too old for a dog? I think she was probably about nine. Oh. But she was having um, arthritis. Oh, and, sure. And, oh, yeah, well. And other problems, too. So putting her out in 80 acres, and that's what we were certified for, mm -hmm. is to search for somebody within 80 acres. She got too old for that. So Brooke was actually a flat coat retriever, and she was donated to me by the breeders from St. Cloud. And she was an amazing partner. And because, again, we don't do a lot of um, live finds, mm -hmm. I also trained her and certified her for therapy. So when she wasn't looking for people, oh. then we went and visited uh, people oh. in the hospital. I love to watch that. I have a friend who did it for years. Yeah. And you see these people, it's like a miracle. Maybe they haven't spoken. Maybe they haven't mm -hmm. responded. Mm -hmm. That dog comes into the room and their face just softens. I know. And years it, and it's melt not away. Just the, it's just not the person laying there either. It's also the family. Yes. You know, if the if the if the um, patient isn't able to relate, mm -hmm. you know, the family will, and that gives them some sure it does. downtime and a right. chance to talk about their past dogs and Aww. to relax a little bit and just give it's them good a for everybody. something else. Absolutely. So who's your dog now? Yogi Bear. Yogi and Bear? He is, what is he? He's a black German Shepherd. Oh, and he is, back to the Shepherds. Yeah. When I decided to retire Cookie from Cadaver, I knew that I wanted to go with another Shepherd. Um, I believe that shepherds just relate better when law enforcement is calling you yeah. to to look for somebody. Um, I think they relate better to, to German shepherds. And because I had three girls at home, I did not want another female. So I wanted a male. Mm -hmm. And I wanted a very strong-willed one, and I got one. So he has taught me a lot about handling mm -hmm. a very strong-willed, determined dog a very high drive dog and he, force of nature oh yeah have any of your children shown an interest in any of this <laughs> for themselves i have one daughter in minnesota who has done who's doing foster care she for for dogs so that's oh. about as as close to sure. what i'm doing is you know that any of my kids are doing they sure. all have they all have dogs but she has uh, taken on foster dogs. Sure, she's taken it a she's step got, further. Uh, two or three of them right now. Oh, see, yeah. I couldn't foster dogs. I no, they would never go Break back. Break your heart would. Oh would yeah, them away. no, they yeah. would just have to move in. Yeah. That that would be it. And then I'd be kicked out because I'd have you know fifty <laughs> cats and whatever you got. Yeah, I'll take it. Yep, yep. How long do you want to do this? Would you like to take a walker, put wheels on it, and? Zip around with the dog. I mean, is this a passion? <laughs> it became a passion. I mean, it, it, it grew into a passion, but it became even more so. My late husband, I call him the farmer, um, was diagnosed with Lewy body's dementia oh. and many years before he did pass. Yeah. And when that happened, <clears throat> I had the two dogs, at the first, my first two mm -hmm. at that time, um, Cookie and tippy toes so and they both did life finds so I they both had a special command to find the farmer so that I always knew that I could count on my dogs anywhere to find him anywhere on our farm sure, sure. you know if I didn't know where he was that must have been reassuring it was because it's amazing when my husband was sheriff here in Washburn County mm -hmm. um, the calls we would get with people that just sundowners that would just walk away. Yeah. Sometimes they would be deep in a swamp. Yes. You know, now we've not only got the dogs, but we've got the drones, which are right. a huge help. Yes, they are. But I remember Absolutely. every time deer season started, we'd get calls. And it would be like 2 o'clock in the morning. And my husband would always say, why do they wait till 2 o'clock in the morning to realize their husband, their son, their whatever is I missing? I know. And they used to bring out the dogs and go into a panic. And finally he learned to call the local bars. And so often the hunter would be at a local bar, completely forgetting to call home. Oh. Yeah, so that was that was their first uh, <laughs> their first line of inquiry is where's the local bar? Yeah. 
Yeah, Absolutely. would you send him home, please? His wife is in a panic. But they are amazing. Dogs are amazing. Yeah. I mean, when they can find cancer, yep. we have underestimated. I think a certain amount of our generations have underestimated. Where so many other nationalities, so many people years and years ago, mm -hmm. I mean, they they were a vital part of their community mm -hmm. because they would find game. They would they were valuable. Mm -hmm. And now you know we've bred them into cute little fluffy poos that have esophageal problems and. Mm -hmm and tumors and it's kind of sad to see that noble dog that working dog but there's a lot of them yeah there's a lot of dogs you know that couldn't do this job i mean we i screen agree them. we screen them very carefully i agree before you spend two years putting all that time and effort into daily training this mm -hmm. dog for that final certification so that you can be deployed so there's a lot of dogs that should be fluffy little. I agree, sitters. and if that's what you're and looking for, yeah. fine. Yeah. How do people find out more information about you, about what you do? Do you have a website? Do you have a contact um, information? Do, but I don't remember what it's. <laughs> I think it's like dot org or Synthesite. But if you look up Canine Emergency Response Team, you'll see our our website. Do you have to write the whole thing out? <laughs> They could send questions to you, and you could pass them on to me, too. Oh, that and would be good. Yeah, absolutely. Canine. Canine Emergency Response Team. Emergency. I think we do a capital K, capital E, capital R, capital T. Is it case sensitive? Because sometimes it's not. I don't remember. It's okay. been so long since I've Googled my own <laughs> team. <laughs> well, no, you're too busy playing with the dogs. <laughs> I find this absolutely fascinating. I am going to order this book, Death's yeah, Acre. There's a lot of good books out there on search and rescue. Who knew? And yeah, I have quite a library. Um, and as far as my uh, putting putting my walker out there with my all-terrain wheels, you know, I may. I don't know. Um, I sometimes think I might be on my last partner. And it's actually my hope uh, to mentor a lot of Sure. Younger people. We yeah. need more younger people coming in to carry this on, and I'd like to be able to mentor them while I still have some of my brain <laughs> cells left. Yeah. Um, so if there's anybody out there that uh, has been thinking about this, yeah, absolutely. Google Contact. it. Google Our favorite, us. Google it. Send a, <laughs> send a yeah. question to Dryden Wire. Dryden Wire, and she'll send it on to me. And you bet. And we'll see what we can do. Absolutely. I think it's marvelous. I just do. It's it's something you never think about. Oh, are you still looking for cemeteries? Right now, I have three that I believe we are going to be using. Okay. And um, I do want a fourth one for backup sure. for whatever reason um, that we may not be able to use one of the other ones. Okay. I still am trying to get a hold of the town chair for, I think it's Evergreen Township. Tom, maybe it's Tom Kessler. And I'm still trying to get a hold of him to get full permission to use, I think it's Rocky Ridge Cemetery. Yes. Uh, but I did talk with somebody who was there visiting her children's graves and mm. she gave us she says, absolutely, I give you full permission to to use my children's graves. Uh, bless her heart. No kidding. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you never know. Mm -mm. No. <laughs> so. And who knew that today's guest would be a cadaver dog searcher who loves her job. <laughs> Thanks for stopping in. We went over just a little bit, but I had a funny feeling we could have talked for a long time. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you again. You have, welcome. you have been just a treat. <laughs> Thank you. Stop in again next week. Sit down, have a cup of coffee, join us at the table. And until yeah. then, remember what I always say, keep it cooking. <laughs>